So good morning or good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mareike Peterson, and in my role as the chair of the TEDRIC subcommittee Outreach and Communication, I warmly welcome you to TEDRIC's webinar entitled Your Slides, Your Story, Your Attitude. Make your presentations work. Our speakers of today are Deborah Powell, Jose Alonso, and myself. And there was I hand over to Deb. Hi, everybody. Welcome again. Um, and we're excited to be meeting with you today to share with you uh, some of our background about presentations and expertise and ideas we have. And we're here to learn from you as well. Uh, we'd like to share our experiences and focus on key points that all of us can manage. Um, and none of the three of us are experts in this. We have a, a experience from different directions. Uh, we are not expert designers or graphic artists. Uh, we appreciate working with those folks and would love to learn from them as well. Um, we'd like to emphasize it's about communicating ideas. We all invest a lot of time in the different things that we do in our endeavors. And so it's important we're able to communicate our ideas, uh, to connect with people, and to look for ways in which we, we can work together and emphasize the importance of the skills that we're talking about here today. Um, so again, we want to iterate. This is not about needing to be a specialist. We're looking for ideas that are not complicated to implement and ideas and tips that we're all sharing with you. And, and, and again, we'd like to learn from you as well. And with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Jose Alonso to get us started. Thanks, Jose. Hey there. So I think that I'm going to share my screen, first of all, so we can access to the slides that should be working. Yeah, I guess so, yes. So yeah, as Deb said, this is made, uh, this, this will be my actual title slide. <laughs> this is made for people who are not designers and don't have the time to be designers. So we will try and put together some really nice, uh, we think, suggestions to make your presentations better, okay? But that's basically the expectations that we have. Uh, yeah, it will definitely be useful, I'm sure. So let me just start by telling you this, you know, the number one principle, I believe at least, to make a good presentation, right? It's the same one, I believe, to keeping a living, a happy, healthy, decent life, which is this one that you're going to be seeing right now. Common sense. As I said, we don't need to be designers in order to make a powerful, at least, or compelling or engaging presentation. This is at least my belief, right? So this very kind of broad principle of common sense, I like to divide in three different rules, right? First of all, number one, if you make a mistake for your, for your class, you just don't want to make any tape. I understand that for some of you here, maybe you don't even know what a tape is, but I'm talking about a musical tape, right? So some of you might actually know what I mean, uh, if you're old enough, at least as old as I am. Uh, what basically that says is that if you want to do something that really matters, that is really important for somebody else, in this case, your audiences, you have to take your time to do that, right? This is not a very practical, very down to earth, very design related kind of rule. It's just a general rule. I think of it like this. Chances are that you have spent 15 years of your life, probably more studying. Now you have spent 10 years, probably five, maybe 15, maybe, I don't know, working. That makes about 20 years, 25 years. And then one day you have the chance of communicating, sharing what you know, what you really are passionate about, with some people who are willing to give you the time and the attention in order to learn from you, you know, to share knowledge with you. Are you gonna tell me that you're gonna use 20 minutes to put your slides together and do your presentation? That doesn't make a lot of sense, right? You have been working for 25 years, 30 years, 10 years, I don't know. You really need to take your time to do a good thing because communicating what you know is a big part of what you do, right? So take home this one. Presentations are about sharing your passion with others. You don't want to do that lightly, all right? Rule number one, that's one. Let's get into more, let's say, uh, hands-on material right now. The three rules of the common sense, number two, people like nice things and they like looking at them. What does it mean? That you need to engage. You have to make that your presentation is engaging, that people keep looking at them. And for that, you need to get 
that it's harmonious. I think that it's a good thing to think that nice, when I say people like nice things, nice is not so much about being beautiful, but about being harmony, harmonious, being coherent, right? Because at the end, design is language. And if you want a language to be useful, you want a language to be a tool that you can use in order to communicate things to others, you need to make it coherent. In other words, you need spelling, orthography, you need syntax. I say that spelling and syntax equals to crap. It's not crap as we normally understand it, but I'm talking about the crap principles, contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. We're going to be talking a little bit about them um, because they're very important. They were originally created for graphic design, not for PowerPoint presentations or presentations at all, by somebody called Robin Williams, which is a weird name to have. Robin Patricia Williams, much better probably. Uh, so yeah, this is about graphic design, but we're gonna be applying them to like PowerPoint presentations. So let's start with the first one. The C stands for contrast, right? So I would like you to take just 20 seconds of your time and use your chat, please, to tell me what you think works in those three examples or what is it that you think that doesn't work in those three examples. Please think about contrast. What do you think it's working and what do you think it's not working? 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Let's hear it. I don't see a lot of comments in the chat. There you go, there's Gail. Background makes it difference make a difference to what pops okay. Gray is not working. White works well. Yellow attracts attention, but not so clear. Gray background, lack of contrast. All right. Those are common mistakes that we normally do in a lot of presentations, right? It's cool to use colors. It's cool to use uh, different, you know, sources of beauty, let's say, but you have to use them like wise, wisely. Right. In, the, in my particular opinion, what, that, what doesn't really work with one of the examples on the right, with the one on the top, with the gray one, is that it makes it difficult to read. It's contrasted, but it's not enough contrasted. Right. Whereas the one in the yellow, I'm using the two colors that I'm going to be using consistently throughout the representation, gray and yellow. The yellow mustard kind of color. I think that the problem with that one is that it kind of corrupts a little bit the actual logo of Tadwick. You have the original version on the left. On the back, uh, on the background in color white, the one in yellow kind of makes it look like it's a different kind of green, a different kind of. It invades pretty much the thing, right? So you have to try and use contrast, but you have to try and use contrast that works, right? The one that makes it easier to read. That should be like your mantra. This has to be understandable. This has to be coherent. It has to be easy to understand. Creativity is fine as long as it is useful too. Right, that would be like the main teaching of this slide. Let's take a look at, uh, let me see here, if I can continue. There you go. This is another, another slide with some text in it, all right? I want you to do the same. I want you to take a look at it, read what it has to say. The text is from the Tadwit website, and please comment on what you believe that in terms of contrast might work or might not be working. 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Go to the chat for that. Okay, too much text and the messages are not clear for the audience. Black and bold works fine. Lighter gray, not, lighter gray, not so much. Inconsistent font colors, and some formatting, too much to read. The link doesn't pop, <laughs> that's a good one. That's unintended, actually. Lack of highlighting. Okay, let's leave it at that. All right. The problem, I would say that the problem with this one is that, there you go, is that there's not enough contrast. But the biggest problem that I see in this one, this text, apart from the fact that there is a lot of text in this, somebody, somebody mentioned that before, and rightly so, I think that if you can read with attention what is in there, you can see that there are three different ideas. The first one has to do with the goals of Tad Week, those two bullet points over there. Then you have a little text that talks about the community of Tad Week. And at the end, the last paragraph that includes the link 
It's about if you want to learn more, if you want to more information about this and that, go here, go there. So we have like three ideas in there, but we wouldn't get to see them so clearly. Just a little bit of contrast like this one would have helped. What have I done? I have just highlighted a little bit the two bullet points in there, making sure that the font is big enough for, to be understood. I have separated a little bit the, 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 the paragraph talking about the community. I have given it a little title too. And then for the learn more section, I have used this little box in there. It's not a big deal. You don't need to be a designer, but I guess I understand that this is a little easier to understand that there are three different ideas, as I said. Let me just hide this thing because otherwise I can see it. There you go. You know, the one about the goals, the one about the tag with community, and the one about learn more if you need to learn more, right? So as a conclusion, regarding contrast, good, very good, use contrast, but one that works. Otherwise, you know, it might be actually more difficult to understand. Second, contrast is more than just colors. You can actually use different sizes of text. You can actually use different fonts, different shapes. You can use italics. You can use bold too, that sort of thing. Okay, let's continue. The art and craft stands for repetition. And I hate to do this, but I want to use my own slides as an example of this. Repetition basically refers to that you need to take a coherent approach to things. If you take a look at those slides over there, you will see that I have been using, for instance, in terms of color, I have been using consistently the same colors all the time, yellow, dark blue, you will see that I've been using the same fonts all the time, even though with different sizes, etc. So just by looking at them, let's take a, a look at a bunch of uh, principles that are very nice. I would strongly recommend that whenever it is possible, you use a metaphor, right? The one that we're using right here is the racing car. You know, I will be talking about the, let's say, exterior value of a presentation, that is the slides, you know, the, the ones that people normally see first, which or less could be equal to the body of a car, right? Then Mariike will be talking about the narrative, how you move forward, your story, the things that you have to present. So more or less it will be the wheels, if you win, if you will, or the engine maybe. And then Deb, she will be talking about how to steer kind of the situation, the presentation. So it doesn't really go anywhere that you don't want it to go. So that would be more or less like the wheel or the pilot or something like that. What I mean to say here is that you don't really need to be a designer to find a good, good metaphor somewhere, or you need just a photo that conveys the message they want to give. Once you get that, use it and use it consistently, right? That would be the metaphor. The color palette I have already mentioned, right? Take a number of colors, the ones that you find uh, that are suitable for the presentation that you have to do, go for them consistently. Same fonts, sizes, consistent, because if you're consistent, you will be more coherent and you will be saying, you will be doing what I said before, using a language, because design is a language, in a coherent way. At the end, it's all about making things understandable. Actions, animation, you have seen, for instance, here at the beginning, common sense was an animation that came from the background. Take your time was an animation that came from the background. And I have been more or less following, you know, regular uh, ways of following the same actions throughout the slides. That's also important to gain in, in coherence, to gain in, um, yeah, in clarity, basically, right? Okay. So repetition, conclusion, think of a good approach and stick to it, basically. Use it. You can say, let me go back a little bit, that I have been using also a little elements, you know, like only the, the body of the car, a little bit of the, you know, one of the, uh, the beginning, I mean, at the, the, the top of the car a little bit. It's something you can do. All you need to do is just cut a little bit the image and that's it. You don't need to be a designer again. You can be creative, right? If you take your time, rule number one of common sense. So the A in CRAB stands for alignment and that's really easy to understand. You need to try and make things harmonic. One of the things I really hate when I see a presentation is this. Look at that, this thing. I hate it with my guts, really. It's not so difficult to try and make things align. Because again, it's all about getting the attention of the people and getting the, 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 the coherence of the message. You know, If you do these kind of things, you deviate the attention to some other elements. And as a consequence, people don't pay attention to what, it, to what they should be paying attention, which is your message, right? So how do you do this? Very easy, very, very easy. You have two, three ways of making sure that you can align things very well. 
Let me see. One, the first one, that would be the one here. There you go. You can use the guides. Every uh, software like PowerPoint or Google Slides or any, any of those, they all have guides that will let you set the guides in a position, a fixed position. So you can actually use the same distances, same spaces and everything to create your, uh, your text, of course, right? Use them. It's very easy. View, guides, show guides, you'll have them there. You can move them, you can adjust them to the distances that you need. It's really, really flexible, right? Of course, you can also do what I normally do. I don't use the guide so much. What I do is that I just copy the slide, paste it. I create exactly a clone of the slide, and then I change the text. And that way, you can actually guarantee that the text will be aligned, will be perfectly coherent and harmonious, you know, with the, with the rest of the presentation. What happens with the images? Same thing. If rather than taking an image and pasting it there and trying to make it more or less look more or less the same position the one before, just right click on the image and go to replace image. There will be a little dialogue popping in your screen that says what image you want, what image you want to use instead of the one that is there. You just have to choose it and it will happen. Now, careful with that, because at some point it might happen where it's happening in this slide. I want, I wanted the, let me see the that one. I substituted the Tadwig 2023 in Tasmania logo by the logo of Tadwig, but because it has different shapes, kind of resulted in so like a little bit of cut on the top and at the bottom of the logo. Okay, be careful with that kind of thing. But as a tool, I think that's very interesting and will warranty that we have a little bit of coherence in terms of alignment too. Conclusion, copy and paste for your friends and also our guides on the right button of your mouse. Let's go for the P, which is proximity, proximity. All right, let's take another 20 seconds and let's just see. Okay, let me just, okay, I'm just looking at the chat because I cannot, you know, pass the slides if I'm looking at the chat. So I'm not looking at the chat, okay? Uh, Deb or Marike, if you see that something is going on in the chat that I should be paying attention to, just please let me know, all right? So take a look at that and please let me know what you think is not going okay with that, 20 seconds. And write in the chat, please. <laughs> I'm seeing some good points in the chat, actually. Not sure what to read first. Happened to me too. Boring. Happened to me too. The label moved from the image. All right. Slightly out of alignment. All right. There you go, Nikki. You nailed it. <laughs> the main problem, and I'm leaving the chat right now so I can actually go with this, is this one. According to the crap principles, you know, in terms of proximity, you normally want to put together the contents that go together, right? So if you have the name of the company, you can put it in there. And then, okay, we're going to talk about the address. You put it together so people understand that those two things go together. And then separately, the contact information. Happened sometimes, happened in one of the slides that we saw before, the one without any contrast, with a lot of text that you didn't allow you to see different ideas in there. You need to make sure that you put together the ideas that go together. That would make it easy for the audience to understand. All right? Good. Those were the crap. Alignment. Conclusion. Use visuals to segment for segmenting your information. It's really important too. So back to the three rules of common sense. We have seen one, which is like, take your time to do it. Please don't invest 25 years in doing something and then 20 minutes in trying to communicate it to people. If I have to tell you just one message to take home, it's that one. Much more than the rest of the presentation that I'm giving, it's that one, all right? So that would be the first. The second was engage or trying to engage. And we, get, uh, we talked about the crap principles. The third one would be, if you speak loud and clear, people generally understand you better right? Makes sense too. Quite, you know, logical, obviously. So the thing is that you're going for clarity. You're going for clarity. This is very interesting, I think, this idea. Your priority is not you. The priority is that everyone understands you. I'm saying this because of, we normally, for example, one of the things that most of the people would identify, would identify as a mistake when making a presentation is to use too much text, isn't it? A lot of people say, yeah, well, that has too much text. Yeah. There is a reason for that, of course. You know, it's easier to read than to actually talk, 
from the back, uh, from the top of your head, obviously, right? So what we do is that we think about ourselves and we make, we make sure that we have in our slides all the text that I need to make it easy for me. But that's a problem because it doesn't make it easy for the rest of the people in the presentation, which is the audience, right? So we do not have to think about ourselves. You have to think about the people who are trying to understand this. Let me just address a couple of, well, three classic anti-clarity approaches. You will definitely identify them. You will, I mean, they will sound familiar for you. Absolutely. This is the one that I normally call the brick. Too much text. There's no way, absolutely, absolutely no way that you can listen to me while I'm showing this, what I'm showing this to you, because you're probably too busy trying to read that thing. So you're not paying attention to me, which is actually what matters. So the actual lesson here is use the text that will help you say your piece, not use all the text and everything you have to say and put it in the slide, because then you will have this problem. People will not be listening to you. They will be reading or trying to read what you have written in the slides with some difficulties because there is some guy talking while I'm trying to read. So obviously this doesn't work. One solution, storytelling. I know it's a big word. It's a little bit of a scary word actually because we don't know exactly what it means. Let me go back to some of the, some of the slides that I have been using in the presentation. We had this idea, the clarity one. Then I used another slide to create a little bit of expectation, you know, two classic or three classic anti-clarity approaches. And then I went for the first of them. I used three slides rather than using just one with all the anti-clarity approaches. And I didn't use a lot of text. And I gave a little bit of a rhythm to the presentation, if you will. So it's a good thing, actually, that you use more than one slide to convey a number of ideas. Give them, give each of the ideas a slide. It will be more fluid. It will be more rhythmic in a way. And it will be made, it will be made easier for the audience to understand. It's just the same, right? So the lesson is more slides, less text. This is the second anti-clarity um, approach, which is, I call it the intruder. I don't think that I need to explain a lot. You see that whoever did this, which is me, uh, try to create some like, uh, you know, cool design in the background, you know, some corporate, you know, mention of type within everything. It doesn't work. And the simple reason why it doesn't work is because it makes it difficult to read the information. Again, we're going for clarity. We're going for coherence, not for beauty, all right? So in this case, the beauty is kind of in the way of clarity. We don't want that. Solutions to this, to this, very easy. You can simply remove the thing. That would be the first one, quite radical. You can try and reduce the size and put it in one of the corners. Or you can go a little original and say, okay, well, you know what? This is for tat with people. They all understand that the logo is the logo. So if I cut it in half and put it on the side, I guess that basically people will still understand that this is the tat with logo. And at the same time, they will have more space, clearer space to read the instructions that are in the slide. This is just a solution. A bit better, I think, at least. No? Uh, let me just think, uh, it's impossible to be seeing the chat with a lot of things, you know, and then not being able to read it. Uh, okay, there's a conversation there going on. No problem. I can, I can ignore it for now. All right. The third anti-clarity approach is the one that I called what our kids do. And this is very important, I believe. This is one of the most important ones, if I have to say, about the clarity issue here. What happens? It happens that even if you don't think about it, when you're doing a presentation, there are at least, at the very least, two different sources of information working simultaneously. One of them is the slides. They give information. The other one is you. You're speaking there, so you're giving information. And then, of course, it's the WhatsApp and the guy who's sitting next to me and everything. So we can actually talk about three or even four sources of information working at the same time. If you don't measure how you inter how you make them interact, you will get a potential cacophony. And as a result, people don't understand. And if people don't understand, they don't make questions at the end and they don't take anything home because they haven't understood properly what you were trying to say, right? So what should I suggest for this? I call it counterpoint, right? For those of you who know music, you will know that counterpoint is an art within the music domain that says, well, you have a melody saying something, the rest of the instruments are trying to like get in the background to let that melody kind of highlight, you know, so people can actually understand the message. When that melody goes down, then you have space to have some other instrument saying something different, saying another melody. This is more of the same. You have to design your presentations. You can interact with it. 
because the presentation, even if you don't want it, will be saying things. Sometimes they will be more or less the same of the things that you're saying if you have put a lot of text in it. But even if you reduce the amount of text to the minimum, they will be saying things. So you have to interact with it and you have to make it work. So counterpoint, when you're talking, <laughs> the presentation is not talking. When the presentation is talking because you're showing an image or something, you are not talking, right? So you can use the, the, the presentation as an anchor point. You can use it uh, in order to visualize some idea, some abstract idea that you're giving. But as I said before, do not use it to just replicate what you're saying, because otherwise there will be two things said, more or less similar things said in different ways through different channels, one of them need, that needs to be read, the other one that needs to be listened to at the same time. Cacophony, doesn't work, right? All right. So I think that this is pretty much it. If I have to, you know, summarize a little bit the big principle of let's have common sense when we do these things, you know, the first one would be take your time. I think it's, I, I put it the first because I think it's the most important. Presentations are about sharing your passion. You need to give it time. You need to give it hours if possible. You know, remember everything that we talked about a few minutes ago, finding a nice metaphor that can actually help you convey the message you have to convey, uh, make a good use of contrast, of colors, of different sizes, put together the things that work together, all that kind of thing, that demands hours. I am a communications guy, I'm not a scientist, you know? And I'm sick and tired of seeing, and really sad actually, to see lots of scientists and people related to the science world doing presentations that do not work, that do not work. And every time I think the same, my goodness, this guy, this girl has been, years putting together all that knowledge and it's actually interesting if you really listen to it but you cannot because something is in the way a bad slide or a bad attitude that will tell us some about it or something about it or a bad use of this and that right so please take your time that's the most important thing take it very seriously you know because communicating your passion only happens efficiently if you take the time to do it efficient second engage with the visuals the crappy uh, harmony that I talked before, right? Color, contrast, repetition, coherence, same approach, use it, etc. And then prioritize understanding, as I said. You know, you have to be clear, and you have to be coherent with your visuals and try for, I mean, by all means, to avoid cacophony, which is what happens when you're trying to say the same things that people can read in the slides. So if I had to say that this is more or less a summary and that uh, it's time, yes, it's time for me to go to my dear colleague, Marike, to continue with the narrative part of things. I'm approving you so you can actually... All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jose. So uh, I think after we now learned a lot about how to prepare a slide and what is important for um, how for the visuals, um, it's time to talk about the wheels. Um, it's time to talk about the message of your presentation. And before I'm sharing some hopefully recommendations for you. I would like um, to know a bit more um, what you are usually doing. So how are you setting up your, your presentation? And we set up um, Paul here in um, Zoom and I kindly ask Deb now to open the poll and you will see three questions hopefully. Well, our first technical challenge, we will have plan B because relaunching the poll, it, we tested this beforehand, y'all. It is, uh, uh, no, it worked. Second try. Yes, it, thank you. Yeah. So we have three questions. The first one is, do you usually set up your presentation in a common structured way to convey your message? Um, the Second question is, are you aware of any rules or methods how to engage better with your audience or when it's coming a bit to storytelling methods? And um, if you think about the past, so do you remember a really great presentation or do you remember a story of a good presentation? And if yes, why? Just give us three words for that. And um, the, the poll is still open, so you can um, 
add to this uh, while I'm talking. <laughs> so to save some time and we will share the results then in our common notes document. So uh, with this, I would like to proceed. And it's again a kind of a repetition. So take some time before you start your presentation, not just the slides, but also the content. So what is your story and who are you actually talking to? And with this kind of idea in mind, I would like to um, recommend some variables you need to think about when preparing the story of your presentation. So first of all is your audience. So who is your audience? You should think by while you're preparing your presentation, who are you talking to? Um, because they are not only they are not all the same. So you might have um, your scientific community so your peers they know what you're talking about they're working in the same discipline then you have the broader scientific community they are scientists but in different disciplines then you may have funders you are talking to and they you are convincing them that you have a great idea then you might talk or need to talk to the board of directors which is a challenge but at the other uh, at the same time, also talking to the general public is a challenge. So, and I think this is not it's just the starting list. So there are different groups maybe you need to talk to. And they all somehow change um, the amount of background information you need to give, the amount of details they are interested in, the usage of acronyms, the explanation of um, specific terms. So sometimes it's not necessary to add those terms to the presentation. Sometimes you need to explain them. So keep this all a bit in mind when you're thinking um, about um, the audience of your presentation. And of course, some people might be more interested and but it's always good to add some for further reading to so to share some resources at least at the end of your presentation. So people which are really interested and would like to know more about that could read that after your presentation. And yes, they joined you in your presentation. So they are at least somehow interested in your topic, but you never know and make your um, presentation interesting for them. Make it important. So make them being a kind of part of your story so that they um, would like to listen to you until the end of your presentation. And of course, sometimes it's kind of a challenge. So because you might have um, different people in one room and one um, knows everything and the other one is totally new. So you need to find a bit of balance. But I think this um, it, um, this adding resources option is quite useful. And of course, you can always say, if you want to know more about that, please contact me um, after my presentation. The next thing, what is important is what is really your purpose. So why are you presenting here? And why should I listen to you? So um, is it convincing your audience, convincing funders, um, describing just a problem to your colleagues or your director? Or is it um, the presentation of scientific results on a conference? Make it clear in the beginning um, what your audience can expect because this somehow, um, sometimes it's really difficult if the audience has different expectations than uh, you as a speaker uh, would like to convey during that um, talk. And now um, coming to your story. So of course, storytelling tools and methods, they are all over the place. And in theater and in, in movies, you usually have this kind of three act structure. You, so in act one, you have kind of the description of the scene, the setup. In act two, the confrontation. In act three, this kind of resolution where you also have the climax. And um, this helps us, of course, to add some tension to, to your story, to movies, to, um, to the theater. 
but does it also work with scientific presentations? Because if you have um, scientific publication in mind, you usually have this um, set up with uh, introduction, material and methods, results and discussion, but this does not add any tension if you present this in a, um, in a talk. So um, there should be different approaches. So um, how can you really create a message for a presentation that sticks so what people remember? And there is similarly to this uh, three act structure, um, the and but therefore format. And you see here some um, example um, from the literature, from this uh, nice little story. And with this words and, but, and therefore, you add structure um, to your text and at the same time also some tension. So you have this kind of background information. Um, some in that situation, you um, add something, so you add the end. And then you have the but, which adds um, tension to, to your story. And therefore, you explain. And then you are coming to the end. And you have a kind of moral. And you can use this kind of format also um, in kind of our disciplines. So you standing in front uh, in a talk, and you have this cool stuff. You have this cool data. And this can definitely be used. but there's a challenge, there's an obstacle, and therefore you need help, um, you know, to do this or that, or you need funding, etc. So this is really pretty easy um, to use this also for your presentations. And um, finally, um, last not but least, uh, create a, a conservation with your audience. So talk to them and engage with your audience. And this is quite easy. You can ask them questions. And of course, some of the questions should be prepared prior to your presentation. And then you can uh, easily ask them at the very end or in between. And um, leave some time. Also, if you ask a question, you should leave them some time that they can answer them maybe after the presentation. So you can ask them earlier and use the tools you have. Like in virtual um, presentations, you can use, like we did here today, um, the polls. You have this Mentimeter option. But even in a physical presentation, there might be some whiteboards or pinboards where you people could add uh, comments or questions to your talk, uh, even after your presentation. So. In a nutshell um, of this kind of story part, um, adapt your presentation to your audience. It's not one fits all. So maybe even of the same topic, you might need to have several uh, presentations depending on the audience. Take time um, to think about your message um, you would like to convey, so what people can expect from you. And uh, apply all these available tools and methods, which I'm hoping you are sharing in our common notes document um, here today so that everybody can make use of that. And finally, engage with your audience. And uh, with this, I would like um, to hand over to Deb. Hi, everybody. Well, that was fun. Now we've romped through what to look at, uh, how to construct sort of the visuals at our, uh, and a little bit about the narrative. And now we'll talk a little bit more about um, how we steer, how we get in that car and get, um, we've used those things to get where we want to go. Um, Marika, I need to request remote control. There we go. Hi, everybody. So I'm Deborah Paul, and I know many of you, but I also see uh, new names and faces. Uh, I was chair of TADWIG, the Biodiversity Information Standards Group, for two years, 2021 and 2022. And I worked for IDIG Bio in the past as workforce development manager, and now I'm currently with the Species File Group, where I work as a biodiversity informatics 
community liaison as a sort of boundary spanner between just as the pieces of a presentation that we're talking about today uh, between our community and our various, uh, so our biodiversity informatics informaticians and software developers, uh, the taxonomists who use our software, collection managers, ecologists, policy developers, and uh, working together to make sure we're all moving toward our individual and collective goals. So I would also like to start with a poll to find out a little bit more about your presentation ideas. Uh, where do we learn what we are talking about here? Uh, what's distracting in the kinds of things we're talking about, presentations and structures of them, and uh, a little bit about your methods. So here's the poll. I hope I'm going to end that poll. Sorry, y'all, technical difficulties while I share the results, which it wants me to do from Marika's poll and stop sharing and end that. And then I'm going to start the other poll. Nope. It won't let me. Okay, I will do my questions out loud and we will enter them in the chat. So where do you learn uh, your presentation skills or where did you learn them? So it's just in a couple of words. You know, did you learn them in a class? Did somebody actually teach you how to give presentations and structure them? Ah, somebody managed to launch it. Are y'all seeing it now? Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Wasn't I wasn't able to do it. Ah, thanks, Marika. So we'll just give you here another minute to answer these questions. This may be new for some of you. Uh, Zoom has a new feature, short answer, where you're actually able to. Um, can you all see the poll? I don't see anybody. There we go. All right, people are jumping in. give you roughly another 30, 40 seconds. Yeah. Okay, ending in three, two, ooh, somebody just got in, one, yay. So let's look and see uh, what our audience can share with us today about this. Uh, so now you see the results, yes? Cool. So again, we can see that some people ask for feedback, uh, some people maybe not. And I personally have never used this feature before. So we did practice sharing the polls, but I had to see the output. This is what I actually see. I don't see the actual values. Do y'all, out of curiosity, since we're learning together here, do you actually see what people typed in for short answer? I don't mean you see your own values. Fascinating. All right, y'all. So we will go into Zoom and share these um, afterwards. We can actually go in and then look. So I'm going to stop sharing and keep going. So you might have to put a few things in there. What I'd hope to do here when I'm going to show my points is to highlight ones you pointed out or didn't um, as a counterpoint. So you'll have to help me as the audience to, to, to do that. So I'm gonna stop sharing that. Yes, stop sharing. All right, good. So on that note, what I'd like to do now, Marika, 
there we go, oops, is talk about things that um, can be distracting in our attitude, in the way we present and communicate uh, the ideas that we're standing up in front of the room or in front of a poster to share. So we might talk fast, like I do, and many of people here will tell you that I check with them and ask them, am I going too quickly? Or I ask them afterwards, uh, how was my pace? I try to make sure that I make good use of the microphone. I recognize that it's not about me. It's about making sure that my ideas and things can be heard. And there are people um, in the back of the room. There are people that might have hearing issues. There are people who might have sight line issues. And again, being able to hear um, is sort of key point in getting your message across. And regarding tone and speed, I, I would keep in mind that some people struggle with things like monotone. And sometimes I wonder if that's not related to nervousness, for example. Uh, for me, I try to think about it as having a conversation. I'm not I'm actually talking with people, talking with friends, talking with colleagues, and I wanna make sure that my tone is essentially conversational. Um, bored or distracted, again, I often wonder if that's either the audience or me. It could be that maybe something happened on your slides. Uh, maybe you were expecting your notes to show up and you got to the venue and discovered that your slides were gonna show up, but not your notes. How many people have had that happen? You get there and discover you not going to be able to see your notes. Got to get a plus one in the chat. Yeah, yeah, we, we've many of us have had that happen. So if you can be very distracting and nerve wracking, both if all of a sudden you were going to depend on those things and they're not there. So there's some aspect here. Those of us who have uh, taken lessons in something, whether piano lessons, skating, the instructor, the, your mentor explains to you the importance of moving forward. Um, your audience doesn't know about these things, so you don't need to let them know. They certainly won't know if you um, skip a slide that you thought was going to be there and it's not. They, they don't need to know that and they won't remember details, so just keep going. Um, yes. Please, in terms of engagement, think of that. The point of you getting up there is, is to engage with the audience, right? Practice helps. And sometimes we have friends and sometimes we can have a friend like a duck. This is a thing I learned in the carpentries community, talk to the duck. So if you don't have an, a ready friend to help you get one and literally give your talk and practice it, um, giving it to uh, someone, or in this case, a duck. What about lack of preparation and mistakes? So again, your prep, lack of preparation can show in more than one way. But, but again, your audience doesn't know this. And about mistakes as well, acknowledge them and move on. But we don't need to belabor them or say a lot about them other than to just keep going. And many of them are invisible to the audience. So something we can do is improv. And I'll explain a little bit more in a minute, uh, a concrete example of how improv techniques can help you. A lot of what I learned uh, when I asked you all, where did you learn your skills? Um, I learned mine through theater. I learned mine um, in grade school uh, recitation. We had to memorize poems and things like that. So learning to get up in front of an audience and connect with them and how to do that, I did not learn in my scientific degrees. This audience fit, Jose related this as did Marika. So if I am giving a talk to a lot of ecologists and I wanna talk about ecosystem services and maybe the data standards for conveying concepts between ecological systems, then it's fine for me to use ecosystem services. It's not okay for me to do that if I'm talking to a group of potentially university administrators from all the departments across the university or if I want to use such a term, I need to define it first. Otherwise, we're leaving many, many members of the audience behind. And in some ways, we're telling them that it's their understanding of our topic isn't important to us. And that's not a message we really want to be sending. The same thing is true for acronyms. 
I find this a difficult one. Uh, I find having allies helps. If I slip up, there's some kind person who puts them in the chat or uh, helps me remember uh, to explain before I use such a thing. This is an interesting one we could spend a lot of time on. This also can be from your audience when questions are asked, or it can be from yourself, but this notion of being defensive or potentially dismissive. Um, sometimes defensiveness, depending on the situation, is hard to avoid. There's an interesting improv technique called yes and. How many people in this room know yes and already? Plus one, please, in the chat. All right, so yes and uh, from the improv world has to do with uh, the many of us would say something like yes but instead of yes and. So in an improv world, you want the conversation to keep going. You're trying to work with the other people on stage. Uh, you're making it up as you go along uh, to a large part. And yes and helps the conversation keep going. So when someone has something to add or offer, and they may have a nuance that is different from yours. Simply saying yes and continues the conversation. It validates their input and your ideas get added. This keeps things going. If we say yes, but it can sound dismissive. It can sound uh, condescending, for example. Um, so it's a, it's a structure to avoid sounding defensive and also to avoid uh, dis dismissiveness. Uh, it's also a good way to, to diffuse if an audience question comes across as uh, particularly pointed or challenging, acknowledging that person and saying yes and to them um, can really help move things forward in a positive way. Here, I wanted to talk a little bit more in detail about what it takes to convey an idea. So if your idea, especially if it's an abstract one or a complicated one, sometimes with expert bias, we can forget what our audience um, may not have as a background. So one easy way to help with this is to try and always start from the concrete and then move to the abstract. So if you're talking and a, a simple explanation or example here would be if I'm talking about calculus and I want to explain a second derivative equation, I can throw that equation up on the board and maybe 1% of the room can understand it. I myself would prefer the graph with the X, Y, and Z axis. So I can see, for example, the maxes and mins that are present um, in what this equation conveys. So start with a concrete. So for example, Jose mentioned metaphor and we're using the metaphor of the car. Start with a concrete thing and then move to the abstract. And this will help you take many more people in the room with you. All right. Again, be passionate. We talked about this. Your audience comes along if they really want to go get in the car with you and go for this trip, right? Be a facilitator. There are many kinds of gaps you'll be bridging. You're bridging idea gaps, this concrete to the abstract. You're bridging uh, disciplines. You're bridging roles. So you're making, you're helping people find their connection to your topics and your ideas and the ideas of each other in the room. Uh, again, use yes and, and consider power of I don't know to invite your col collaborations and ideas to come from the room. Just a couple more slides to wrap up. Um, social media spoke, too much text is certainly the number one thing, but it wasn't the only thing that people shared. When I ask them, uh, what's up with presentations for you? What's your uh, pet irksome things? Brooke Byerly uh, from the Botanical Research Institute of Texas spoke up. She very eloquently shared uh, what we've been saying here. So again, give the ending first, practice storytelling, think about where do you get these skills from? Why are they important? Is, 
if you value these skills and you want others to do this, again, value them in the work and the roles that you have with helping to make sure that the people you work with, the institutions you're at, um, find ways to get these into the curriculum, find ways in which uh, people can learn these going forward, offer courses, et cetera. So going forward, consider things like improv. Um, I think many people here already have a growth mindset. You're open to new ideas. That's why you're here. There are groups like the Toastmasters. Uh, they will offer you ways to practice and give you uh, tactics for presentation skills. Um, ask artists and storytellers uh, to help you uh, construct your stories. I asked ChatGPT. I said, please tell me what are the major problems and what are some things you can do about them when it comes to attitude and please give me a table. And it did construct me a very nice table with just these things. It also, I didn't ask for them, it also gave me some cool resources, which I share here. And we'd like to have yours, which we put in the, uh, the Google Doc to learn more from you. Thank you from all three of us. With that, we have like one minute left. <laughs> we might go over just a little bit. Um, I would be interested since we couldn't see your answers yet, could you take a minute, if you can stay, and tell us where you learned your presentation skills? Yeah, thank you, everybody. Where did you all learn? Can you type them in the chat instead so we can see them? Did you learn them in university? Did you learn them on your own? Ah, oh, you did have a university course. Yeah, Marika, learn by doing. Sure. Ah, Sabina, so yeah, copying when you see somebody do it really well, for sure. I wish more people, Monica, had a course at university. Mm. Ah. All right, so we have a lot of variation on the theme here. It's great to see that some of you do have some formal training and you get that. That's really nice. Um, you can see that many of us are more of a learn on the go as we go. Oh, look at that. Thank you, William. All right, this is why we have a, oh, Marika, would you like to say goodbye? Yes, so thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I have to run. Thanks for all being here today. And if you have ideas, type them still in the Google Doc so that we are aware of your tips. Jose, would you like to share final thoughts? What do you mean that? Well, you'd like to say, you know, any final ideas, thoughts? We oh, well, wrap up. No, that's a good thing that we act. I mean, the mere fact that we just are addressing these kinds of topics, it's a, it's something good in itself, actually. Um, you know, uh, because it allows us to to understand the, the the relevance of having good presentations and communicating well what we know. Uh, yeah, so it's a good precedent, actually. I would say, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, everyone. We know there's lots of things we didn't talk about and didn't cover, but uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, what would you like to see covered? Put your hand up, offer to present, offer to share. This would be fabulous. Um, yeah, Sabina, we are only 20, but on the other hand, we are 20. So it's up to us to help be part of the community that spreads the need for these things and be resources for these things. So if you have ideas and topics we didn't cover, like I said, I, we, we certainly left you room. Um, please put your hand up and, and offer to share. And thank you for joining us.